Is the gospel inclusive? How should Christians think about the myriad of ethical and biblical questions surrounding the larger LGBTQ conversation? Well, today, Scott Rain and my co-host from the Think Biblically podcast are going to talk about a more recent book called The Gospel of Inclusion by Brandon Robertson. Now, the way we reason we picked this book is not to pick on him, but because this book is a good representation Agreed. of many of the affirming kinds of arguments that we're going to respond to. So if somebody wants to pick up a book that makes a case for an affirming position, he does a nice job doing so. What we want to do is push back biblically and push back kind of theologically on some of the arguments that he makes. Yeah, in fact, the subtitle I think will be helpful for our, for our listeners. It's the gospel of inclusion, a Christian case for LGBT mm. plus inclusion in the church. And that subtitle is exactly where I think we want to begin. So let me ask you, in what sense should, in what sense is, is the Bible inclusive? Well, in one sense, it's, it's when it comes to salvation, it's inclusive in an absolute sense because n nobody, regardless of, you know, sort of where they, regardless of race, gender, class, creed, sexuality, anything, is outside the boundaries of the cross of Christ. Uh, no, nobody can say, you know, I, I either don't need the cross or there's no way the cross could cover my, my life and where, where I've been and what I've done. Right? Okay. Uh, the way I think the New Testament unfolded was the progressive inclusion of people who were con one, at once considered outside of the people of God. Okay. Uh, as you know, the, the people of God were identified as the nation of Israel in the Old Testament. I think there, there's, there's a handful of believing Gentiles or non-Jews in the Old Testament that are, that are held up as examples of faithfulness to contrast Israel's unfaithfulness. But in the New Testament, that's developed in a lot more depth and detail where non-Jews are included in the, the economy of salvation. Uh, women are now treated as equals among the people of God. Amen. Uh, Although I think you can make an argument that women in the Old Testament were also treated as equals to men because they were both equally made in the image of God, mm -hmm. which was not the case throughout the ancient, throughout the ancient world. Sure. And also uh, based on socioeconomic class, uh, where you know household servants or slaves were considered co-equals, co-heirs with their masters in the kingdom of God. So ra radical. Uh, countercultural inclusion uh, in in terms of the the web of salvation, but it, I think what we need to be careful of it doesn't follow from that that every you know lifestyle that was redeemed is one that's acceptable in discipleship going forward. In fact, there's a good reason that we call it redeemed. <laughs> okay, uh, so. I think it, it depends on in what sense you are – if you're describing inclusion in the you know, 21st century terms, that's different. Those are a different set of categories than I think what the New Testament had in mind. So a lot of the debate is about what we mean by inclusion, and the gospel is for all people, all races, both sexes, including people with same-sex attraction, without gender dysphoria, without – all are invited to come to the throne and accept God's grace and be a part of the church. Right. But it doesn't follow that all understandings of marriage, all understandings of gender are therefore included because all people are invited to be a part of the church and repent from their sins. Right. We, we welcome, the gospel welcomes everyone regardless of where they've been. Mm. But, but the gospel does not affirm every place that they've been. Okay. okay, and that's not just on LGBTQ issues. That's on all issues. That's, that's on the that's on the possession of wealth. Got it. Uh, that's on okay the idolatry of work. You know all sorts of other things. Okay, well, one of the common arguments that is made, and Brandon raises it in this book, but others have made it as well, is that we evaluate true prophecy from false prophecy based on the fruits. 
Now, this comes from Jesus' teaching in Matthew chapter 7, where he says to kind of judge a tree by its fruit. And the argument is that traditional teaching on sexuality, that marriage is one man, one woman, commit a relationship for life, brings harm to LGBTQ people. And since it's harm, it's bad fruit, we should reconsider the teaching and consider it false and unbiblical. Now, this is one of the most rhetorically powerful arguments. When I first heard this, I thought, if my teaching is bringing harm to people, that's I'm gonna a heavy re- I'm gonna rethink what I'm teaching. weight to bear. Yeah. Yeah. So before we get into that passage, should we evaluate teachings by their biblical teachings by their psychological effects on people? Well, I think in in some cases, yes. Okay. Because, but 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 I don't think that should be determinative of whether they are true or not. Okay. Whether they're true or not is determined by the degree to which they line up with the clear teaching of Scripture. Now, I think it's important, I think, to dis- distinguish between, uh, you know, the psychological effects of something and its, its ontological truth or falsity. Those two are not necessarily related. It's really interesting when you, when you see the work of our, our colleague Preston Sprinkle, mm-hmm. who's talked – I mean, he's, you know, he's done lots of empirical research on this, and he makes a distinction between – the position that people hold and the way LGBTQ folks are treated in the church. And I think the, mm-hmm. the issue is how are people being treated, and that's different than the position actually that's being held. And a lot of people who, who, who want to be faithful to Christ but also are in the LGBTQ community, they, I mean, they make it pretty clear that it's how they were treated not more, much, much more so than the position that's held mm. that, is, that is, is the main contributor to how they've been turned off to the gospel. Mm-hmm. And in fact, many of them, when they, when they recognize that, they, that their faithfulness to Christ is more important to them than living out their sexuality, often look for a church, not the affirming ones, but the ones who hold sure. traditional views on marriage and sexuality. So I think it's, I mean, if, if I'd say if, it, if, if the way I'm treating people or the organizations I'm leading are treating people in ways that bring harm, we need to repent of that and change that. But the position and the treatment are two somewhat different things. Now, our position can be articulated in ways that are harmful, no doubt. Gotcha. But, the, but that's, again, that's different from the position itself. And then okay. that's, I think, the thing that we need to hold on to. So take so. something like divorce. It, we want to know what the Bible teaches about if divorce is permissible, and if so, when. We care deeply about people who have been divorced, going through divorce, being harmed in marriage. But biblically, the question has to be, what is the purpose of marriage, and when is divorce permissible? At, yeah, at the end of the, I, you know, I have a good friend who is in the middle of this wrestling at, at the moment. Mm. And he's very clear that the only thing he cares about is what the Bible teaches on this. Wow. He's put his self-interest aside. Wow. Um, you know, it's, and I, I, I commend him for the, how, how deeply he's wrestling with this. Uh, and he, I mean, he's even concluded if, if the Bible teaches that – the, the divorce under the conditions that he's working with is not legitimate. He's he is okay being alone for the rest of his life. That's quite the commitment to to scripture. It's, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a great commitment to biblical authority, uh, and mm. I and I commend him for it. And I think our our views on sexuality and the psychological part of that need to be similar. Now, if we go to Matthew chapter seven and actually look at this. What I found is if you look at the verses before, 15 through 20, and you look at the verses after, Jesus is not saying you know a tree by its fruit in terms of the effects in somebody's life living it out, mainly the subjective effects or their experience. Rather, it's the fruit of obedience and the fruit of repentance. 
It's an objective fruit we can assess. Does this teaching cause somebody to repent and turn from sin? Does this teaching encourage somebody towards obedience? That's what Jesus means in the rest of Matthew 7 and also in the rest of Gospel of Matthew. So I think biblically, we're on solid ground, even though this has rhetorical appeal to people. Yeah, and even even things like the the fruit of the spirit. Mm. You know, those are uh, you know, those are observable character traits, not psychological effects. Mm. Uh, so I think it's that that's borne out also in the rest of the New Testament. So here's one of the questions I want to I want to put to you okay. is um, we, we often hear people say that the types of relationships, same-sex relationships, that people are trying hard to justify biblically and theologically, uh, the argument is made that the the permanent monogamous same-sex relationships, there's no category for those in the Scripture. And therefore, the Bible is silent on those, and we are free to you know, assess those, make our own decisions on those as we see fit. How do you evaluate that? argument that the Bible really never addresses the main type of relationships that LGBTQ advocates are, at least within the church, are trying to to justify. Yeah. So I would, uh, the first thing I would say is, all right, let's see if that's actually true. So you look in Leviticus chapter 18 and 20, you go to Romans chapter 1, and you see a punishment for both parties engaging in this behavior, which shows there's a level of mutuality that's taking place. So it's not master and slave pederastic relationships minimally. So that doesn't get us all the way to the exact modern understanding of this, but it does show that it's talking about a kind of mutual relationship in which both are engaging in it, hence there's a punishment for each of them. So that's the first point that I would make. Second, I would say is I'm not sure totally that it matters, even if they're right. Now, with that said, we actually do know, and again, Preston Sprinkle has documented this in his book, People to be Loved, that there was a sense, a kind of an ancient sense of sexual orientation that somebody was born with certain attractions. There were committed, loving, long-term relationships in the ancient world. And we have reason to believe, given Paul's understanding of the ancient world, that he likely was aware of these. So I'm not quite willing to dismiss and say, we know Paul was not aware of these. We don't. He may have been. But on top of that, I don't know that it really matters. If the Bible is talking about our design and our function and our creation as male and female, and he's talking about the nature of what marriage is, then some of these modern incarnations are not relevant to overturn God's creative design. We see Jesus in Matthew 19 pointing back towards creation. We see Paul in Romans 1 pointing back towards creation. So there may be some nuances in culture today that are that show that relationships are a little bit different, but not sufficiently different to say that the scriptural teaching does not apply and that scripture hasn't defined sufficiently what marriage is. Yeah, I think that, Sean, that's a really helpful point. I think to question that premise on which that argument is based, mm. that th- there were no permanent monogamous same-sex relationships in the ancient world. And I think that's right to question that. That's, that's, I don't think that's true. Uh, I don't think that was the majority thing. But to say that Paul was completely unaware of that, I, I think is a speculation that's not w- not well grounded. So what what do we say about other uh, other attempts to limit the context of biblical teaching? Say, for example, in, in the in the Old Testament, some of the purity laws in Leviticus eighteen and twenty. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the reasons we have those laws is because of the temptation to idolatry and the prevalence of religious prostitution in the ancient world. In fact, the you know the the God the 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 worship of Baal, religious prostitution was an integral part of that because it symbolized fertilization symbolized the plea to Baal to fertilize the ground to give them agricultural prosperity. That's why it was so widespread, uh, and even in. Uh, you know, in the first in the first century, uh, in Paul's teaching in Romans one, mm-hmm. uh, c- clearly the context there is one of I- idolatrous worship. 
uh, and that all human beings are under sin because we've all committed the sin of idolatry. Uh, and so what, what do you make of the argument that says, well, this, this, this can't be referring to all same-sex relationships in general. It's referring to just a specific type of same-sex relationship. So let's take a look at Leviticus 18. And by the way, I'm not going to build a theology from this passage alone. And I don't start there with somebody when they say, what does the Bible say about, say, same-sex relationships? Because it raises a lot of other questions. But it's really interesting that in, in Leviticus chapter 18, it says, uh, a man shall ha- not have sexual relations with another man as with a woman. And then it moves on. But the passages before that, I think it's 12 or 13 verses, describes the kind of specific incestual relationships that human beings are not to engage in. Now, why would there be you know, a dozen or so verses on incest, but only one on r- the issue of homosexual behavior? Well, if you say incest is wrong, you actually have to define, is that my sister? Obviously. What about a cousin? What about a second cousin? What about, you actually have to give some parameters. But if you're given a statement that rules out homosexual behavior in all circumstances that a man shall not lie with another male as with a female, that statement alone rules out all kinds of homosexual behavior. So I do think even in the Leviticus passage, and by the way, what's interesting in there is there is a sense of idolatry that's built in. Of course, this is in the Mosaic law, but this passage starts off and Moses says, he says, don't commit the kind of sins and abominations they commit in Egypt and in Canaan. And then it starts listing these sins in Leviticus 18. Well, Canaan and Egypt didn't get, you know, castigated or judged for not keeping the Passover or for mixing fabric because that was uniquely a part of the law given just to the Jewish people under that covenant. But they were judged for sexual immorality because they should know it. It's written into creation by natural law, which is what Romans appeals to as well. So I think a case can be made. In fact, this is the standard historic Christian understanding. There really was no debate about this until just a few minutes ago, historically speaking, that homosexual behavior in particular violated God's design as laid out from Genesis all the way into Jesus and beyond. Yeah, now in Romans 1, Paul's not saying that same-sex sexual behavior is the only or, or the worst manifestation of idolatry, just that it's one that's plain and obvious and clear. And when Paul said in Romans one twenty seven, he could have made it less, or could have made it more ambiguous than he did. But he specifies that the natural relation for men is with women, and he hmm. specifically qualifies that as with women. If he had just said that they forsake the natural relation for that which is unnatural then there might be some aid and comfort to the view that that naturalness could be a subjective thing, not an objective sure. one. But he specifies that the natural relationship is the heterosexual one, which I think takes it in more into the realm of mm-hmm. the objective in terms of God's design from creation rather than opposed to the subjective based on my own uh, attractions. I think that's good. And Robertson raises a common affirming uh, response to this, where he says that Paul thought of natural sex as procreative and hence unnatural sex as non-procreative. So Paul isn't condemning same-sex sexual behavior between men and or between women. He is condemning non-procreative sexual behavior. Seems to me this gets to the heart at what we mean by nature and what is natural, especially because you get later in the book of Romans, he talks about long hair not being natural. So how should we understand what Paul means by nature and natural in Romans 1? Well, I think, yeah, his appeal to nature, I think, intends to make this a a universal truth. Uh, And I think by... I think what he's what he's implicitly saying is by appealing to nature, he's appealing to creation. It's natural, 
for a reason. It's natural because God instituted that at creation, and, and it's continued to this day. So I, I think you're right. When you look at the context again, like we saw with Matthew 7, verses before and verses after, when you go to Romans chapter 1, what's the context of the verses that deal with homosexual behavior? Well, if you read the verses earlier, 18, 1, 18 through 21, Paul says God has revealed himself in nature. We know this, but we suppress the truth. His invisible attributes are made known. They're clear to everyone, but we suppress it in unrighteousness. So he's given this macro view that you're talking about. And then it's almost like he says, let me give you a specific particular example of how this is expressed, moves to sexual behavior. And just like it's obvious that God exists by looking at nature, it's obvious that there's a design for sexuality by looking at our bodies. And this is sufficient for God to condemn even people without, you know, special revelation, they should have known what's revealed in nature itself. So I think we see this pattern. It's really important for people to pick up on. In Leviticus chapter 18, when it says a man should not have, you know, sexual relationships or lie with another male as with a woman, this is language reminiscent of Genesis, the creation of male and female. We see the same thing in Romans pointing back towards God's creation. That's the standard I think that Scripture consistently gives. Well, and I think that it's a, it's a bit of an artificial distinction to make between procreative and non-procreative sex in, in, the, in the ancient world because they didn't have any birth control methods. Hmm. I mean, all, all heterosexual sex was procreative, right? Because, and because there were no, I mean, there were no birth control measures to be taken Okay. Uh, you know, I mean, menopause was probably the only way in which, you know, heterosexual sex would not be non-procreative. So it's just it's, it's just the same sex sexuality that's inherently non non-procreative. Uh, so I think I want to make sure I want to sure, make sure we we take into account some of the some of the cultural aspects that existed in Old Testament times and in the first century that I think help us understand a little bit more fully what Paul intended. Mm. Now here's the other thing that that is often said is that sexual relations in the ancient world were more governed by an honor shame context than they were a sin or just or morally justifiable context. In other words, the, the 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 function you had in the sexual relationship was either one of honor or of shame. Mm-hmm. In other words, if you if you were the initiate, if you were the penetrator, that was the honored position. If you were the penetrated, that was considered the shame position. Which mm-hmm. is why you know even same sex relationships were prohibited between Roman citizens because it was it was considered immoral to shame another Roman citizen. Mm-hmm. By putting them in that position, now I think this contributes to to women having a sense of being inferior to men in general in the first century. I think that the New Agreed. Testament changed that. I think it is it's it explains why things like pederasty were very common, although not not exclusively, but they yep. were very common, uh, and why you know same sex in same sex relationships, the person who was in the dominant position was the one who was considered morally in the clear as opposed to the one who was in the more of the passive position. Which, which when, pa- when Paul describes this in 1 Corinthians 6, he actually invents a term to make it clear that both the dominant and the submissive person were guilty of sin and therefore guilty of shame. Mm-hmm. So I think what Paul does is he takes a cultural the, what, what, the cultural way in which sexuality was viewed and turns it on its head mm. and says, no, not – because if, if, if he would have just used sort of half of that term that he invented right. to put the dominant person in the clear, that would have been – I mean, nobody would have thought twice about that. But what made it so countercultural was that he, he issued condemnation for both parties in a same-sex sexual relationship. I think one of the – the differences you and I would have with a lot of affirming arguments is they will look at the Greco-Roman culture that was honor, shame, and the way you described certain homosexual behavior was the way it was understood in the culture. 
and say, therefore, this is the backdrop of why Paul is condemning this. But again, if you look at Romans 1, that's not the language that he uses. That's now, right. it is described that certain behavior is shameful, but why is it shameful? It's not because of what was going on in the Roman culture. It's because God designed men and women from the beginning to have a different function based on their bodies that we can see in natural revelation. So to not use them according to their design is sinful, hence the purpose of the beginning of Romans that we're all That's, sinful yeah. and it's shameful. It's both. So I don't think it's either or, I think it's both. So to avoid the argument he's making from creation, you have to just focus on shame. I think that misses the point of where Romans is going. Right, and even even the language that Paul uses in 1 Corinthians 6 turns that notion upside down. That's one of the reasons our, our friend, the historian Kyle Harper, mm -hmm. has written about the, how sexuality was transformed by the gospel, and the title of his treatment of that is From Shame to Sin. Mm. And what, and what I think what he means by that is he is it, the New Testament universalizes the, the 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 moral wrong of all sexual relations outside of heterosexual marriage, whereas in in the Roman world most of it, if you were in the dominant position, was considered to be morally acceptable. That's a mm. big change, That's a huge very change. countercultural. Let me take us back a minute and uh, talk about a point that Robertson makes that I've heard frequently by affirming uh, scholars and thinkers. It's the idea that the church has constructed an anti-affirming theology from just the five or six clobber passages. And in other words, of the 23,000 verses in the Bible is often cited, only five or six speak of same-sex relationships. So is this position that you and I hold, was it developed as an anti-affirming position out of only five verses in all of the Bible? That sounds compelling on the surface. You think just five or six, this is small, but is that how we should do theology and approach topics like marriage and sexuality? Well, we're, we're not playing a numbers game here. You know, we're not, we're not keeping score as to, to which view has the most verses on its side. Uh, I think what we're asking is, how clear are they? Okay. All right. And if, you know, it, and, and are they determinative of the position that we hold? Are, you know, are they sufficient to, to, to give us confidence in the position that we hold? And I think, you know, the, the clear testimony throughout the history of the church has been unequivocal on same-sex sexual relations. And I don't think that has anything to do with patriarchy. I don't think mm -hmm. it has anything to do with any other cultural factors. I think it primarily has to do with what I would consider to be the, the, the trump card on this, which is not just a single verse or two, but the entire teaching of Genesis 1 and 2, where the, the design from creation was laid out mm -hmm. very clear, you know that Ad, that Ad, you know Adam and Eve clearly uh, designed as male and female, designed to come together as one flesh. Marriage is instituted, and and all of that. And then the rest of the Mosaic Law, I think, falls out of the the or the ordinances of creation. So I think to say that there's only a handful of verses that refer to same sex sexuality, specifically, that might that might be true, but. The context for that, the, the, the grounding for that is much broader and I think much more, um, you know, much more determinative of what our views on sexuality ought to be. And I think Romans 1 is situated similarly. Uh, agreed. So in one sense, right, it's not a numbers game. If there's one passage that clearly says homosexual behavior is wrong, that's sufficient. But the real question is, what is marriage? That's the question. So from Genesis all the way through the Old Testament, we have this understanding that marriage is meant to be, and we see people failing to live it out, that's for sure. It's meant to be one man and one woman in a committed relationship for life. That's about companionship. It's about procreating and filling the earth. 
but that's the outlet for expressing sexuality. And so if we expand and ask the question, what is marriage? You actually see that Darren Belusick in his book on same-sex unions looked at this historically and he said it is one of the most Catholic views. And by Catholic, lowercase c. Yeah. It was universal. It was early. It's consistent. In that case, I think we see it very differently than just looking at five or six clobber passages. Yeah, well, and I think you have to do, you have also have to ask on on what basis is the teaching grounded in the scriptures? So, for example, when marriage is talked about in Ephesians five, mm-hmm. that's grounded in the relationship between Christ and the church. Mm-hmm. You know that that's that's pretty significant. That's I mean that's that's better than going back to creation. Mm. Uh, and so we look at not just not just the quantity of verse, but how how is this teaching grounded? If it's grounded in a universal truth, like the relationship between Christ and the church, chances are very good that it uh, it's, it's also intended as a universal truth. Mm. Now, here's one of the, one of the places where I think the LGBTQ folks push back. Okay, is on something like slavery in the scripture. Uh, you know, slavery was, I think, allowed uh, for a variety of reasons. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think I think we'd all agree that the world is a better place now that slavery's been abolished, right? Not abolished, but moving that direction, right? There's still some worldwide, right? Is what you mean? But we recognize it's wrong. Yeah, and yeah. It, you know, the, the world would be much better off if all slavery yes. were abolished. Agreed. And I think we, I think the same would be true with patriarchy. Mm-hmm. Uh, patriarchal cultures where men are dominant and women have less value, and are seen uh, as either objects or commodities, uh, is is a world that none of us really want to live in. Right now, patriarchy was was well known throughout the ancient world, as was slavery. Uh, and I think you can make a case that even though something like slavery was was deeply humanized by the Mosaic Law and by the New Testament, it still existed nonetheless. And the LGBTQ folks, I think, and Robertson, I think, is trying to make the argument that why isn't same-sex sexuality viewed similarly to slavery, patriarchy, maybe, maybe even um, I might even throw the death penalty in there too. Uh, yeah. So what what would you say to that? What's the difference between slavery and LGBTQ relationships? So this is where I think William Webb's writing, and Robertson interact, interacts with him a little bit. He says there's kind of this redemptive hermeneutic where God takes a broken system where people are at, such as slavery, including his chosen people coming out of slavery, takes a patriarchal culture and ultimately moves it away from slavery, away from patriarchy. We see this very slow, methodical kind of liberation that arises within the New Testament. But we don't see the same kind of trajectory when it comes to sexuality, especially when we look at the person of Jesus. Jesus didn't go around interpreting issues of sexuality in a more inclusive manner in the way we hear people talking today. In fact, if anything, he almost moved in a more conservative direction. You even look at a woman lustfully and you're guilty of adultery. A divorce is only permitted, it seems to be saying in Matthew 19, uh, in cases of sexual unfaithfulness. So if he did move in a more progressive direction on some ethical issues, if we don't see that trajectory when it comes to sexuality, And even in the early church in Acts 15, there's still this sense of like, we're moving away from the law, but avoid sexual immorality. So I just don't see that trajectory. I see consistent pointing back towards creation as the guide rather than this other kind of trajectory moving forward. Yeah, I think think it's fair to say that the Mosaic law was given not so much as an ideal Mm -hmm. of what the moral life should be like, though it does, I think it it has lots of things that are ideal about it, but it was primarily, I think, given for damage control in a fundamentally fallen, broken world, which is why, 
if if in, in the ancient world if slavery had been abolished carte blanche, uh, mm-hmm. a large part of the safety net for the poor would have been gone. Mm-hmm. And remember, there was no welfare state in the ancient world. There was no, you know, you didn't you didn't pay your taxes to help the poor. You paid your taxes to help the rich stay rich. And so, if if house if household servanthood had been abolished then the poor would have had n- literally no place to go but the streets and homelessness. Mm. Uh, and even in, in, in Galatians 3, where it says, you know, where it's this great liberating verse that talks about now, you know, n- now uh, they, we are, we're all equal, we're all co-heirs and equals in the body of Christ. He cites uh, women and Gentiles mm-hmm. and Slaves, mm-hmm. those three. So it's based on you know, gender, race, and socioeconomic class. And conspicuous by its absence is any reference to sexuality. That's true. Where that's, I mean, Galatians three twenty eight is supposed to be the great sort of Magna mm-hmm. Carta of of human equality and inclusiveness. But that last part, mm. no, nowhere to be found. Mm. And I give Robertson credit initially. When he's interacting with Webb, he doesn't mention at all that Webb himself That's right. strongly denies that there's any redemptive trajectory when it comes to same-sex relationship. Now, later on in the book, I give him credit. He finally does acknowledge that. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's, I mean, in, in, I think in, in Robertson's view, because slavery was abolished and patriarchy was largely done away with, then we also... It just naturally follows from that that LGBT folks are included without right. any biblical evidence to suggest that that's the case. I think that's a great distinction to make. One of the other arguments that he talks about, and I've heard frequently from uh, affirming affirming thinkers, is that, like, say, for example, Peter has this experience in, in Acts 10 of the Spirit, and is this experience-based hermeneutic that now we can appeal to the experience of people who are LGBTQ and they have positive spiritual experiences, thus the spirit is moving in new ways. I don't, part of me is like, I don't wanna resist the Holy Spirit, that's the force of this. But on the flip side, one point that I make is I would say, okay, time out. There is a big difference between in the book of Acts when we have the first time the spirit going to, or the gospel going to Samaria, going to Gentiles, going to the ends of the earth, and Peter, who is an apostle who saw the risen Jesus and had unique authority at that point, and us pointing towards our experiences apart from scripture. That's that's one point I would have. What would you say about that position? I'd say, yeah, this wasn't Peter's experience. This was direct revelation. Hmm. I mean, this came directly from God himself, and he recognized the movement of the Spirit among Gentiles. But that dream, you know, that all, that all animals are now clean, referring yeah. to Gentiles, that, that's, that's about as direct revelation as it comes, and, and even more so because it was actually written down and inscripturated. So that that is completely different, in my view, than a, than the subjective experience of you know of LGBTQ folks uh, sort of you know finding themselves and uh, you know I, I, I actually I commend uh, folks who are same sex attracted who are transgender wanting to, wanting to take their face seriously and I think we need to affirm that. Mm. Uh, and you know, th- for some, that that involves really painful choices to mm-hmm. take their faith, faith and their allegiance to Christ seriously. And we've had we've had a, several folks, on, you know, on our podcast yeah. who have done that very thing. Um, and, but it's you know what ultimately is the trump card for them is not their same sex experience; it's the objective teaching of Scripture. And I think that's ultimately where mm. the debate on this lies. And I think at the end of the day, if the Bible is clear, then you either accept it or you don't, and then we let the chips fall where they will. But I'm I'm often skeptical of of attempts to what look to me to, to be evading uh, 
the clear teaching of the church, uh, of the scripture, and the clear historical tradition mm. of the church until very recently. Mm. Let's tackle a couple more questions. Uh, this is one I've, I've never asked you, Scott. I'm curious what you would make of the question of whether or not sexuality and issues of same-sex marriage are questions or matters of Christian orthodoxy. So we all talk about how we want to die on the essential, so to speak, and be just you know gracious on not so much our demeanor, but just compromises we have to on secondary issues. Where would you place this? Well, maybe we ought, maybe we ought to define what we mean by primary and secondary issues first. Okay. I define primary issues as those things that you have to believe to be a believer. And that if you don't believe those, you're outside of Christian faith. Hmm. Right? So that's that's not very much. Right? I'd say it's it's the gospel message that Paul describes in 1 Corinthians 15. It's the you know the fact that we've all sinned, the cross and resurrection, uh, the Lord's return, sure. authority of Scripture, things like that. Just because they, just because we call them secondary, I don't think means that they're less important or that they matter less to human flourishing. I think that that's a mistake. I think that 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 doesn't doesn't follow. Okay. So I think I would I would hold that that distinction is somewhat arbitrary, although I think I, I kind of like the way I've yeah. you know, teased it out. Um, but, and, and clearly, the, you know, all those primary things, those are hills I'm going to die on. And there are, there are some things that, you know, that the Bible teaches that I, you know, that I don't consider hills to die on. And this, I think that our teaching on marriage and sexuality, I think, falls somewhere in the middle of those. Hmm. And I think I go back to Ephesians 5, and the way the Mosaic Law is structured, and that leads me, that leads me to hold that our views on marriage and sexuality, um, since God created us male and female, and there's something about male and female together that reflects the Trinity in ways that not much else does. And that in Ephesians 5, it reflects the relationship that Christ has with the church. Those are really foundational groundings mm. for those things. And so I would that's why I would consider them a matter of, quote, orthodoxy. Um, not, not that you have to believe that in order to be a, uh, you know, a part of the body of Christ or to be a part of the, the kingdom of God. Um, now, I think we probably need to make a distinction, too, between – between gay and celibate, or mm-hmm. side A and side B. Sure, sure. Uh, and you know, I, I don't think that necessarily being uh, being gay and involved in, and sexually involved necessarily disqualifies you from membership in the kingdom. Uh, I think you know, gay and celibate. I think is the preferred position biblically and theologically. Uh, I think only only those things that that I would consider to be the the primary issues those are the only things that disqualify someone from mm. from membership in the kingdom. Now, I'd want to know I say it depend I'd want to know uh, if somebody if somebody's struggling with it that's different than somebody who's of who's not. Of course. Uh, but I guess I the, the marriage and sexuality is a, that's that's a hill that I would die on because of how it's grounded. I I just I think that's a really important thing that we ought to be we ought to think really hard uh, before going backward on that. The Bible begins with a wedding. The longest chapter in the Torah in Genesis is about the wedding of Isaac, finding a bride for Isaac. Ten Commandments, right? We have honor your father and your mother. Do not commit adultery. Don't covet your neighbor's wife. Like three of them build in Mm -hmm. natural marriage. Jesus talked about marriage, Matthew 19. Paul talked about 1 Corinthians 7. He said Ephesians chapter 5. The Bible ends with a wedding, right? Of course, of a different kind of Christ, you know, and the bridegroom and the lamb, et cetera. And given that the- But it's it's in an analogy that we all know about. Exactly. But 
if we're going to understand Christ's love for the church as a kind of marriage, we've got to get marriage right. So that's where it's so important and central. It's a hill I will die on. But ultimately, if somebody believes differently about it and acts differently, it's God's job to judge. I can't judge somebody's heart. Right. Doesn't make it a less important theological issue. But you also have 1 Corinthians 6, where Paul lists, and this is where he uses the term you're referring to er earlier, arsenokoites, where that Greek term referring to, I think best understood as you know male betters, referring to same-sex sexual both, behavior. Both parties. Both parties, correct, as something that separates people from the kingdom of God. Now, of course, that's not the only sin that's mentioned there. Paul condemns exactly, all right. of us. That's very important to yeah. bring out. But I look at that, I'm like, wow, if Paul's going to place committing this sin in the category of those who will not inherit the kingdom of God, I'm actually not being loving if I don't speak right. that truth. So. That's the piece that we have to bring in as well. And that's why you and I, even on a topic like this, wouldn't necessarily choose to offer a critique of an affirming position, but it's it's tied to the gospel in some fashion. Yeah, it's it, tied to Christ's revelation of his love for the church, so we feel compelled to speak up. Yeah, it's not one of those issues that's not important. Mm. It, it is important. And I think one of... One of the things that I think we're starting to see a little bit more of, and, and Robertson actually surprised me in this a bit toward the end, when he admitted that uh, you know the, the permanent relationships that, that sort of once once you dispense with traditional marriage, you know, sort of all bets are off. And he actually has some support and is, is not is, is not uncomfortable with uh, relationships of more than two people. Yeah. Uh, so polyamory, polygamy, whatever you want to yep. call it, uh, and I and I think this is one of the things that I think uh, folks who hold the position that you and I do mm -hmm. have cautioned about for some time. That once autonomy, and once you know my you know sort of my body, my choice, and I get to love whoever I want to love, there's no compelling reason to limit that to just one person. I think that's exactly right. If you make if you take biological sex out of marriage and it becomes a genderless institution, and it's about mutuality and love and care, then how do you limit it to two? And the answer is you can't. You have to be in favor of polyamory. In fact, I don't even think you can rule out something like incest because you could make the case. Right. The Bible wasn't talking about the kind of loving, mutual, monogamous, ancestral relationships we're talking about that we hold today. So. I think that's where these things lead, and it's not a slippery slope argument. It is a logical extension. Yeah. It might be what you and I would call reductio ad absurdum. Yeah, With, uh, yeah we'd say it's a logical slippery slope. Yeah, I, I, uh, I, as, as I think, a, well, it's yeah. a logical slippery slope, but if you hold A and it leads towards B, and B is affirming something like ancestral relationships, maybe your position back here is wrong. It's a natural logical move, That's right, exactly. as, you obviously, as you obviously well know. That's right. Wrapping up, any other thoughts that, that we missed, you want to say, well, about the book or? I, yeah, I, well, I do, I, it's, it was interesting that, uh, you know, the, the transgender discussion is, a, I think, an entirely different one. Agreed. And, and in my view, a bit more complicated, mm -hmm. both biblically and theologically, because I think b both of us would view gender dysphoria and not a, or or the transgender movement is not as something to be celebrated, but something that's a result of the general interests of sin. That God created male and female, to use another term in a binary way, but because of the entrance of sin, we do have people who feel not at home in their bodies, who, whose gender experience is different than their biological sex. I'm actually surprised because of the pervasive pervasiveness of sin that it's not more common. Mm. than it is. I, I would have expected that. And what to do about that, I think, is a whole nother dimension, both morally and pastorally at the same time. I think we need to be aware of some, some of the most compelling research on this by experts at Johns Hopkins yep. has suggested that uh, as, a, you know, as, as a child and a teenager, folks who experience trans, transgender desires 
the vast majority of them do grow out of that. Uh, now, to be fair, what that grows into often is a same-sex attraction. That's right. Uh, but that's a, a different set of questions. I think that's that's an area where I think our, our pastoral sensitivity is demanded similarly to how we deal with mm-hmm. folks who are same-sex attracted. I think what you and I need to do on one of our next interviews is talk about some of the books making a biblical case for transgender inclusion specifically. I think that'd be really helpful. Uh, Again, I hope our viewers realize that we were trying to critique ideas that are important. In some ways, the biggest honor you can give somebody is to take their book seriously because you think it's a good representation of Mm -hmm. a view. Offer response. On my YouTube channel, I've had multiple conversations with people who are making the case for affirming viewpoints. But there also comes a time where you just say, you know what? You and I are going to give our response to something and give our clarity in a different format. That's what we aim to do here. And I think I want to let our listeners know you can expect this kind of thing from us a little bit more regularly going forward because there are there are lots an increasing number of uh, books and movements and articles that are take taking issue with with Christian orthodoxy, mm. and that we f- we feel an obligation to as best we can and gracious as and charitably as we can, without a sense of that we're piling on an author without giving him a chance to defend sure. himself sure. here, but to respond to this in a way that we think is biblically consistent and grounded, uh, that will help that will help our listeners to think biblically about the issue that we're talking about. Exactly. So while you're at it, this is a part of the Think Biblically podcast. You and I co-host this out of Biola University Talbot School of Theology uh, weekly, but we've recently started filming some episodes. So if you're seeing this in video, make sure you follow the Think Biblically podcast on any podcast app that you can find. And uh, it's weekly, a lot of content that's not here. And if you're listening to it, You can also come watch it online on my YouTube channel, on Biola's channel as well. So thanks for joining us.